Thank you for being here with us. Uh, I know you're very busy. The first question that we have is, you know, what does it mean to defund the police? Well, defunding the police is about recognizing that we overspend in, on policing in this country, and especially in Los Angeles, that 54% of our city's general fund has been proposed to go to LAPD, and um, budgeting is a zero-sum game. So if you're giving 54% of your general fund to police, you're not investing sufficiently in the things that actually make communities safe. BLM is an abolitionist organization. Has defunding the police always been front and center uh, to the organization? Or in the beginning stages, was it more of a focus on reforms and then there was a decision that said, you know, reforms aren't enough. They're not gonna fix the issue of racism in this country. We have to move to defund the police. I think BLM always recognized that you could not reform your way out of a system that was built to produce the outcomes that it has. I don't think that we always focused on the budget, which is what we're focusing on now. So the police defunding focuses on the budget. But I think we've always known we've never been, you know, kind of misled in such a way that believes that, you know, modest reforms are going to get us free. I want to talk about the people's budget. It looks like the activism has pushed uh, some, some on the city council to now propose $150 million in cuts. Um, and there's a latest motion from a council member, Herb Weston, I believe, to, you know, dispatch social workers instead of police to certain uh, calls. How promising is that latest motion and how much progress do you feel that you've made? I think the latest motion does a lot to um, pull back police from doing jobs that they have no business or training or expertise to do. Um, and if it's implemented correctly, it could really substantially defund the police. If police are not being deployed for mental health calls or housing or, you know, all of these other calls that don't require police as we traditionally know them to be, then what we'll do is, um, I, I think there's a statistic like over 90% of calls are nonviolent calls. So if you talk about police only being deployed in incidents of violence, I think you're moving very quickly up the road to abolition. And then earlier today, you were at the uh, protest to defund Ella police at LAUSD. Um, I think there's a plan in the works uh, to, to do that, to defund something like 90% of the LAUSD police. What kind of work needs to happen at the university level? Here at Northridge, we have uh, Northridge BLM, which is advocating for defunding our campus police. What kind of work needs to be done at that university level to achieve that um, at campuses? Exactly what you're doing. So students need to be at the center. Faculty need to have your backs. We need to enlist the support of the union CFA and the staff unions. Um, but I don't believe, I think that if there's any p uh, place that police shouldn't be, it's on campuses. Um, that means K through 12 campuses as well as university campuses. Um, they have no business being there. I can't think of one um, incident where uh, school police and university police in particular have helped a situation, right? They've maybe responded after the fact or been used to suppress the will of students but I don't know when school police have actually prevented any um, crimes from happening um, or intervened in a way that's helpful. So I, I hope the students, faculty, and staff will continue to advocate and say remove police from campus. Being a long-term educator, what's kind of the role that student activism plays in the movement? Well, student activism is hugely important to the movement. We know that the best ideas are the ideas from our young people. Young people are less invested in the current system. Young people tend to be more audacious and visionary in what it is they're calling for. And so um, Black Lives Matter, the initial convening of Black Lives Matter, when we were first called together by Patrice Cullors, um, about half of the people gathered were my students from Cal State LA. And so, again, I think students are essential to the movement. California State Senate just passed AB 1460. As someone who's working in the system, um, what else needs to be done in regards to equality on campuses? 
So AB 1460 is a huge step forward and it took us years to get that passed, right? It'll make ethnic studies a requirement in the CSU. We need to stay vigilant around how it's implemented because what we see is mainstream departments pretending like they have expertise in ethnic studies and we know that they don't. So it's really important that it's implemented on campuses and again, we still have to wait for the governor's signature, but I don't think that'll be a problem. I think it will be pass. Um, we need to make sure that it's not watered down in the implementation phase. The presidential election is coming up this November. Uh, we just kind of want to get a feel for where BLM is in terms of that. You know, should supporters of the Black Lives Matter movement worry a lot about voting this November in that election? If so, how should they vote? And just generally, what is BLM looking to get out of uh, that election in November? Yeah, so Black Lives Matter doesn't endorse political candidates. Um, some believe in voting, others don't. We do have, with Movement for Black Lives, an electoral justice um, program, which is really grounded in the fact that we should all have the right to vote and Black voter rights need to be um, protected. So it's not saying how to vote or that even that you should vote, but if you want to vote, that voting right should be protected. Um, I personally believe in voting, and I think that for Californians, it's much more important to vote for down ballot items. So California is going to vote for Joe Biden regardless. So that's done. But I think that it's important that, for instance, we know that the district attorney of LA County has the blood of 609 people on her hands and that we try to stop her from getting reelected. What are some of the big policy issues? I, I know uh, Movement for Black Lives, I believe, that is a focus on policy. Um, there's defund the police. Uh, what are some of the national things? I know reparations is probably one of them. What are some other big issues you think uh, the movement is focusing on? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it ties back into police defunding, right? A lot of it ties back into where do we put our resources? So. As we talk about defunding the police, we also have to couple that with reimagining public safety. So what does a safe community look like? Well, if you drive through downtown Los Angeles, I can tell you what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like, you know, tents and tents and tents for blacks and blacks and blacks, right? It doesn't look like Skid Row being one of the largest black communities in Los Angeles. So it's important that as we think about the chant and the call to defund the police, that we think about what, what it means, what'll be ushered in when police are in fact defunded. So we know police unions is one, but what's some big forces like working against you in the movement today, do you think? So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of uh, ally work that needs to happen. Um, we need to make sure that we pull in every um, segment into doing this work. And I think that we saw that today, um, we were outside of LAUSD school board demanding an end to school police. So when we talk about police abolition, if there's, again, if there's any one place police don't belong, it's on um, campuses. And so we had young people from the K through 12 system really leading that fight. But what was really encouraging is that as we fight for black lives to matter, that we understand, I think that non-Black folks are beginning to step in and recognize that they have a role in that struggle. So we're in constant um, partnership with the American Indian Movement, with Central CSO, um, with a bunch of other organizations, White People for Black Lives, um, and by all coming together to make these demands, I think that those demands become more and more likely to, to come to pass as an organizer and activist yourself, you kind of sacrifice a lot. What are some things like, like that activists as organizers need to worry about at, on the individual level? So I think you can't expect to be trying to topple a system and that system doesn't have consequences for you, right? So if you're going to go up against the state, if you're going to go up against a murderous police department, you have to recognize that they're going to come for you. And you have to figure out what price you're willing to pay. So what is your line? And then, you know, think about your line and being w willing to go a little past it. You know, you're not going to get 
to be the favorite Negro anymore if you're constantly calling out white supremacy. Um, but I think that's an important choice that needs to be made. You may not get that job. You may not get invited to that party. You know, you're probably going to get arrested at some point. Um, but, you know, if you don't sacrifice something, then your struggle wasn't really a struggle. We've seen a lot of diversity and the people who've come out to the protests and the demonstrations. How important is it to, um, to have a coalition along you know, racial, gender identity, sexual orientation, along all these lines uh, and have that in intersectionality? How important is that to the movement? I think it's hugely important to have solidarity. Um, I think that true solidarity always begins by accepting the leadership of those who are most impacted. So Black Lives Matter should never be led by a non-Black person, right? What we're doing is challenging non-Black folks, um, especially white folks, to follow the leads of Black people. And so solidarity means being willing to do that. So as student journalists, we've thought a lot about how to properly cover the movement and the demonstrations. Two questions. Generally, how does BLM feel about media coverage? And more specifically, there's been a lot of debate around, you know, photojournalism of protests and publishing pictures of protesters and demonstrations. And where might you stand on that? Media coverage is hugely important. With media coverage, you're bringing more people into the movement. And so, you know, I always welcome media coverage because it amplifies your messaging. Um, so, you know, I understand what people are saying about privacy, but folks are at a protest, how private are they really intending to be? Um, what you don't want to do if you're being responsible media, what you don't want to do is just tell the story that's prepackaged by, you know, the district attorney's office, by the police, by other powers that be. And so it's really important that um, journalists engage in a way worthy of that title of journalist. What's your message towards the, like, the next generation of activists, the, the future of activism? Like, what's your message towards those young people? Um, I think it's really important that you understand your own power, that you don't have to accept the world that you live in, that all of your most radical imaginings, all of your innate senses of fairness and right and wrong can come to pass if you're willing to fight for those things. I'm hugely encouraged by especially the Gen Zers who, you know, really don't take no stuff. Um, who've been willing to step wholeheartedly and fully into the movement. And I think it's going to be the young ones who in really short order are going to take the lead.